Hello there, my name is Fond. I am the DM for the game The Throne of Adar, and this is currently the DM diary for the 12th session that we had just now finished. There are quite a few things I actually want to talk about today with this one. However, I think I'm going to limit myself and firstly do a short recap of the session, and then I'll get more into describing some of the things that happened, some of the uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and experiences I've had because of it. And as well as probably what my players have kind of thought as well. I must say, this session has probably been the most... Um, hmm, what's the word? Informative and peak of all our sessions so far in terms of things to talk about. And uh, drama as well, I think, even. <clears throat> but in case you haven't watched the VOD or watched our stream... Let me give you a quick summary. The players, finishing coming back from the Maple Springs after checking out the vandalism, return with Miranda Ilgrut to the Springside Inn. There, they talked to her briefly about a few things, just common courtesies. She actually gives Hawkins the rotten corpse, though the hand that they first got from Hippo that he had accidentally left with the laundry maid. It was mentioned that the laundry maid was very scared, but there was nothing that really came out of it. Miranda passed it back to him after they've had quite a few taunts, so she trusts them enough to assume that it's probably just a misunderstanding. So, with that, she also gives the, each of them a red scarf to help hide the weird piece of metal around their neck from when they got muzzled by Spark and Kronos ashamed. So, after they talk, they just stay there briefly before they decide it's time to leave. They are on a time schedule, after all. They're being timed, and they don't really want to know what happens if they don't get back with the tailor to Kronos on time. So they leave the inn and they start heading back to Maplewood. On the way, they pass probably five, six, seven peasants or just common looking folk who have bastards full of cleaning supplies who look at them and for a brief moment remind them of the racism in Kadoi, the human centric nature of them. They don't engage, they don't say anything, but they get various glares and sighs and sneers as they walk by. But regardless of that, they continue walking. They walked, they walked about 30 minutes, so about halfway back to town. They round a corner and round a rock. There around this rock, in the middle of the road, they see a body. It is laying flat on its stomach. It's in a cloak, and the head is faced away from them. Looking at the stature of the body, they can assume that it's kind of bulky. It's probably a male. There's no blood, but there is a backpack full of random goods all over the place and a bouquet full of roses. So, I thought my players would be more cautious, but they kind of rushed ahead. And Kira, the medic, played by Mo5, rushes forward and does a medicine check on them. The medicine check wasn't really necessary because very quickly they realized this person was completely fine. As soon as they went down and they touched them, they didn't have time to check because the cold barrel of a gun was put to their forehead. As the body turned, and a man looked up at them, introducing himself as Willie Rose. This was a man that they had actually encountered once before inside the jail cell. There they had spoke to Joseph Loom, the captain. Basically, he was interrogating them about what had happened out in the marshes. So this man knew that they had the badges, he knew they probably had money, and he knew that he had, they had good information. So he had marked them. And he was waiting for them. So they get there. He puts a gun to Kira's head. Tells them to surrender and raise their hands. He's robbing them. They don't surrender. Now, to be fair, Kit had cast the puppet spell to take control of him and make him drop his gun and run away. Now, technically he should have shot first. But I allowed them to make a death check. Kit succeeded and was faster to cast his spell. Preventing Willie Rose from shooting. With this, combat started. Now... There were a lot of people here they didn't know about. It was it was a prepared ambush as nine members of the River Rats popped out of various piles of leaves from behind rocks. A few of them climbed up using ladders on these high areas and they had crossbows, basically making them be surrounded where they couldn't run easily. They were outnumbered. But Willie Rose still gave them the option to surrender, but they decided to keep fighting. It was a very gruesome fight where eventually they decided to run away. And in their running away, they had finally used their Icon Dice. Uh, icon Dice, they can roll for maybe good things to happen. He, Kit rolled one for the Guardian. So the Guardian contacted him, 
using various weird imagery and words from other people, he basically explained the kit, you need to be patient, and whenever the time comes, do not miss your opportunity because of your pride or being too greedful. So very quickly, Kit would turn and run away, and as soon as he ran at the corner, he would see Shlomo Pig Rider, as well as him riding on Sir Oinkalot, two of the people they had met yesterday. And this was the sign that, oh, they could probably get help from him. Anyway, he ran, runs by him. Shlomo Pig Rider, confused, continues on. He rounds the corner, and he made, comes face to face with Willie Rose. Now, very quickly, it is apparent that Willie Rose and Shlomo Pig Rider have a bit of a past. As Willie's face, very confident originally, he's a very good looking man, charming, he smokes a cigarette, has a rose in his pocket, a very charming man who really streams out confidence. His face turns pale. As he asked him, Love, you're not here to help them, are you? You're free to go, but I suggest you do it fast, we don't want any problems. As he's sweating and his face turns pale, Ashlomo responds, basically saying, more or less mocking the party. He says, oh, do not worry. These are strangers. I don't plan on helping them. My mother said, my mom always said, don't help strangers who won't help you in return. And he continued walking. And after some more talking and some back and forth between them, the party would have realized that Shlomo Pig Rider had actually defeated Willie Rose and his men probably the night before and was the reason he was in jail for the night. So Willie Rose had already encountered this man and this was kind of built so they would realize, oh, this halfling... This bard is actually pretty tough. He's already beat this guy. So that means if we get him to help us, our odds of beating him are much higher probably. But he was probably exaggerating some. But they knew, they wanted Willie Rose's, they wanted Shlomo Pig Rider's help. And so he said to them when they asked for it, he says, you know what I want? The information. The night before he had given, warned Kira that the people were probably coming after her. That they were probably coming after her from whenever she had thrown a rock. At our, during our prequel sessions and had made some wild magic go out of control, creating a disaster. Now, for that information, he wanted to know why Alfonso and Ditzer, the voice of Kadoi, basically the voice of the Senate, had given them a mission. What was the mission he wanted to know? But in response, all he got was, he's an important person and he's looking for an important item, which was not satisfactory and greatly pissed off Shlomo. Not to mention the night before, Stavros had slammed him to the table. It was a very awkward and awful situation. So to get revenge, this was how Shlomo was going to do it. Unfortunately, their player, Shmeeb, who plays Stavros, at this point has left our game. He has real life things pop up, so he's not here anymore. But that doesn't mean Shlomo isn't still upset. Because Kira's still there. So he tells them, you know what I want, tell me the information. And they say, we can't tell you that. Because all these other people are here, we can't tell you that. And he says, well, too bad then. And he keeps walking. And as he walks past him, he says, you better hurry up and whisper it. So very quickly, instead of whispering, they actually yell it. They yell, we were to look for Kronos ashamed. That was our mission. Thinking he was going to help him, and they had lowered themselves. They had admitted the information. They had basically admitted this all, so they, he, would, he would help them. But he says, ha, ah, thank you for the information for yesterday. Good luck. He keeps going on. He only took that as payment for yesterday. So, pissed off, the party yells at him. But he turns back and says, If you want my help, you need more payment. You better start talking, quickly. So then, even more pressured as he is walking away, going to leave, they tell him even more. Uh, Hawkins yells out, We found Kronos Ashamed. He is in Mount Matra, the inactive volcano. Uh, we faced him, we fought him, and we lost. Now we're forced to work with him. And he was basically giving all this really important information out, where all the bandits heard it and everything. Shlomo Pig Rider says, Ah, oh, thank you very much. I hope you don't die. Good luck. As he continues walking. Now, little did the party know, the part he was planning on helping them anyway, but he wanted to uh, give them a little taste of their own medicine, a little bit of the taste of failure, of defeat, of feeling betrayed, the feeling of not being satisfied. So he continues walking, but then Willie Rose being a prideful bandit, looks him and says, Love, we'll let you go, but you better watch your back. Don't let your confidence become too much, you weird little halfling. As soon as they called him a weird little halfling and talked about his height as well, Shlomo Pig Rider got angry. He said to him, he would give him one more chance. 
He would forgive him this once, but if he mentions his height one more time, he wouldn't forgive him. So, Pell in the face, Willie Rose, being a smart individual, realized not to push his bounds and remain quiet. A show and Piggy walks past him and leaves, but unfortunately the bandits around him were not so smart. They didn't like seeing their vice commander of the River Rats being forced to remain silent. So they insulted Shlomo and called him short. Now this was the doom of them all. As Shlomo Pig Rider would turn and join the fight, making it a much more even fight. Not much more easy, but definitely more even. As the fight continued on, Shlomo Pig Rider and Sir Oinkelot would help join, help even in the fields, but still, players would go down. Hawkins would go down. But once he got back up, he would do something very interesting. My players are only about level one and a half. If you don't earn one of your skills, you can't use it. But in this moment, he told me, Hawkins, played by Swills, looked at me and said, I wish to take the dodge action, but I want to look back to whenever Aldania Pedalfeet was doing that beautiful dance that gave us her the witch's blessing. I'd like to take inspiration from that, and I want to start trying to dance, start trying to move elegantly. This was him attempting in the middle of combat to unlock one of his second level abilities. And he succeeded. Taking the dodge action and managing to dodge left and right, he succeeded in unlocking it. Unfortunately, he would not be able to properly use it during this fight until he got his sword back. That's another important thing. A lot of the party members are missing their armor or weapons as they're being repaired. But he unlocks that, but he goes down again. He's brought back up. Kit, our wizard, goes down. And people are getting very weak. People are being shot. Willie Rose uses a gun, and he has no one to mess with. They're having to eat through these minions. It's a rough fight. And all the entire time, Rufus, Sleepy Eyed Rufus, the leader of the River Rats, is there as well. He's not engaging, but he's watching. He said this is not his business. This is business between Willie Rose and them. But he is an unpredictable variable, which keeps the tension high and the party on edge. So as they're fighting, they keep fighting and fighting until eventually the party does start whittling down these bandits. Until eventually they all die. The bandits had actually fought to the death. Normally they would not. But both of their commanders, their leader and their vice commander were both there. So they fought to the death. Eventually the party cleans them up. But Willie Rose, being a smart individual, realizes he's in a bad situation. So he shoots his shot. Then he sneaks off behind some rocks and he hides. Newt, our sharpshooter, who had been fighting him, ends up finishing off the last bandit. And he starts moving down the rock. Now, this is perfectly fine, but this time Willie Rose had shot Kit, making him go down. So the other two party members, Hawkins and Kira, were there using their turn to stabilize him. So Newt, walking the opposite way, goes off by himself, where he walks, uses his movement, and ends his turn right beside Willie Rose. So they start fighting. Using the prone situation where if you're prone, you have disadvantage on range attacks, he manages to avoid being shot. But Newt, thinking the same thing, does the same thing up top. However, unfortunately, my player was not thinking about the realism of it all. So whenever he went prone, I simply had Willie Rose stand up, climb up the rock, and put the gun to the back of his head and shoot him in the back of the head. Now, I don't know if I gave him an advantage or not. Technically, it should have only been uh, normal. But I do not know. <clears throat> anyway, he gets shot in the back of the head, goes down. Now, this is where it gets crazy. Willie Rose is the last one standing, besides the leader who's not done anything yet. The party's really weak, used all their supplies. So he shoots Newt, bat at the head, he goes down, and he takes him hostage. Loves, I suggest you surrender and give me your goods, otherwise I'll shoot him through the back of the head. He's now holding Newt as a hostage, threatening them that he's going to finish him off if they don't surrender. With that, the session ends, leaving the party in disarray. Now, something really important I've learned as a DM at this point is that I really, 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 really need to watch my mouth. And not like I'm insulting people. I need to watch what I say in terms of, because what I say is taken way too literally. Uh, which is completely expectable and, you know, understandable as well. However, it comes to a point where... Uh, something happened during my game. So they, while they were fighting, one of my players, uh, Kira, played by Mo5, which more or less said uh, this. 
oh, it's fine if we die, or it's fine if I die. I can just re-roll my character. No. There are three things I absolutely... My three pet peeves of D&D. Three things I absolutely hate. Number one. Number one. Whenever people say, what's the solution? What would uh, Fawn do in this solution? What does he want us to do? Number one, that pisses me off. Number two. Whenever they say, oh, we can't say what we want to do because if we know what we're going to do, Fond is going to screw us over. He's going to prepare for it. He's going to counter it. No. I'm on your side as much as you are. I want to see you do cool things. I don't want to prevent it. I want to give you up bad things and you solve them. If you tell me your plans, I'm not going to switch it up and then screw you. Number three, whenever someone says, it's all right if we die, I can just make a new character. And not saying it in a sense of like, if I die here, it's worth it. So those are the big three things. And one of them was that. It's fine if we die, we can just re-roll new characters. Now, yes, that's right. But in that moment, it pissed me off. For several reasons I'll get into in a moment. But it made me remember a really weird idea. A really bad idea now, I know, that I had came up with. I had ran it by some other of my player NPCs uh, who helped me run the game. And it's this. As soon as they said that, this is what I said to them in response. Oh, there's also something I forgot to tell you. A new rule I'm implementing. If you die in game, if your character dies in game, I'm going to make you roll a 1d20. And if you roll under a 10, I ban you from my game. You don't make a new character. You simply get kicked out of the game. Permadeath. Now, of course... In my head, I'm like, oh yeah, they don't, they don't want to be like, oh shit, that's serious. But they're not going to be like too serious about it. Because obviously, I wouldn't come up with an idea like that without running it by them. I wouldn't just make that a rule without tell, asking my players, like, hey, are you guys fine with this? Like, does that, It is so insane that I didn't believe it would be taken overly literally. I believed it would be looked at with so much suspicion that it would just be more of like a, a partial fear. Like, he's probably fucking with us, but... Just in case, that's kind of scary, and I should really think of how serious the situation is. But instead, my players took it very literal. And they weren't really instantly against it. I think one of them, MoFi particularly, was very, uh, turned his mood sour because of it, I think. And some of the other ones, no one, everyone said they didn't really like it. Like, they like it, but they don't really like it. So it was taken too serious. Of course it was all a joke. The plan was, if someone does die, and they roll under a 10, I'm like, hey guys, just kidding. It was just to make you guys feel the pressure. As if you as if you were really your player character there. Make you feel the pressure of what it, your character feels like in this life or death situation. And I was just mess messing with you. I'm sadistic, not cruel. That's my catchphrase. It'd be cruel of me to actually ban someone. It's sadistic of me to make them believe they'd be banned but then not do it. But, of course, my joke did not land well, which, after session, I promptly sent, sent a message explaining and apologizing because it very clearly did not work out the way I wanted. But that leads us back. That was a flaw of mine, for sure. That was a huge mistake. And there was another thing as well where I had mentioned to Swills, who plays Hawkins, and to the party in general, that uh, this is a hard encounter because it was built for five people. In reality, it was not built for five people. In reality, I built this encounter literally the, like two session, like literally the session prior, and I didn't even have the creatures on the map yet. So in reality, I built it for four people, and I tested it for four people. But I said that to stimulate, this is actually a really hard encounter, so they wouldn't feel like they just suck. But instead, it left the idea that, oh, if we did le lose in this encounter, it kind of doesn't feel good, because if we would have had five people, we would have won. So... I shouldn't have said this was an encounter built for five people because they didn't take it as, oh, that made sense why this is harder. They took it more like, if we lose this situation, it's I'm not going to enjoy it. It's going to feel like I've been wronged, which is completely fair. So those are two things I've said this session that I've regretted, that I shouldn't have said. But I digress. Going back into the statement of, uh, well, before we get there, so I've learned a lot of things from this session. My players, number one, are... And I think this is a sin of a lot of D&D players. My players have really, really, really bad tunnel vision. They get very tunnel visioned 
on life or death. An encounter happens, and they think it's life or death. And what happens is, from that, they lose creativity, and then they lose choice. Even though the choices are there, and there's so much room for creativity, they lose that because they tunnel vision. Holy shit. This is, we're, we're in a combat, that's not easy. It's life or death. It's not anything else, even though the entire encounter was based around the fact they're here trying to rob you, and they don't want to kill you, they simply want to rob you of your money and your Blossom Badges. Now, to be fair, losing their money and the Blossom Badges is extremely punishing. That would be an extremely punishing moment, and would be awful. But that is nowhere near this being a fight for life or death. But the players don't see it as, as it's negotiable. This is just do or die. That's how they see it as. Because to a player, it's not do or die. It's also win or lose. Because if they're not winning, they're losing. So to them, that's the same thing as do or die. It's not, oh, we can compromise and maybe beat them up a little bit and then offer them a deal and maybe lose some stuff, but keep our lives and so on and so forth. Which I think in that session, they may be forced to encounter that as negotiations are now happening with Newt being a hostage. But that is a thing that I don't even know how to really... It's hard to try and confront that. I tell my players, hey, I mean, you're being robbed. This is nothing in the world. If you lose your money, yes, it's really bad for what you need it for, but it's just money. If you lose your badges, yes, that's really bad. My players are really assumptuous, though. They assume all kinds of things. Even without me making that assumption reasonable, necessarily, they assume all of these awful things. They assume if they lose their Blossom Badge, which is a badge that represents a high official, if they give that to these bandits, they will end up being put in jail for the rest of their life and basically be dead by the government officials. But that's not the case. They're not giving these badges willingly to the bandits. They're being mugged. If you get mugged for the badge, yes, maybe if you go back and they find out you lost them, they're not going to be happy. Yes, you're right. Maybe they might want to punish you or something, but they're not going to say, oh, you sold these to the bandits. You got robbed. It's not the same as if you just willingly gave them up. You're being mugged. There's no, no choice. But I digress again. That's what they assumed. And it's hard for me to know what they're assuming as well because they don't always verbalize it. So I don't understand what's happening sometimes. But going back to the point of Mo5 and uh, some of the other players mentioning how, oh, we can just re-roll. And then also I countered that with my bad joke, which made things probably worse. But it is completely right. It is, in fact, that you can just make a new character. That is D&D. But there is a certain level of disappointment and unfortunateness I feel from this. Because whenever you say something like that, and whenever you feel that way, it just negates all the drama of the situation. It negates everything. Because it shows... Uh, think about this. When you think about d d you think about what's the worst punishment for your characters. The worst punishment for your character is death. What is the ultimate punishment for a player character in d d The answer is death. Now, you may be able to argue there are some other worse things like being cursed or having to do something you don't want to. But ultimately, the worst thing is losing your life in d d and no longer being able to play or anything like that. Your character is no longer... It, it's a real world and your character is dead. That's the ultimate punishment. So as soon as you as a player don't see that as the ultimate punishment, it really throws things off. Because if you don't see that as the ultimate punishment... What is the ultimate punishment? Is there none? Then what is the meaning of all the bad stories? What's the meaning of trying to make your character immersed in the world? What's the meaning of role-playing at all? What's the meaning of anything you do? If, when it comes down to life or death, it's as easy as, well, if I die, I'll make a new character. Yes, you're right. You'll make a new character. But then why... Did anyone put effort into the character that you play? Why did anyone care? Why was there ever a future for that character? If 
everything they do, all of their experiences, all of their feelings, all of their emotions, all of their connections, all of the tragedies they overcome, all of these epic moments that they do and all of the epic moments they will have, all amount to saying, I'll just play a new character. As you basically let yourself die. And you do nothing cool about it. What's the reason? Is there none? Now, I've been thinking about this. And I had asked, uh, Mo5 was the one who brought this up. And don't get me wrong, I love Mo5. As I mentioned in some of my other diaries, he's literally, he's probably my favorite player. Because a lot of times he does things that really make it seem like he is someone real in the world. And that's why it was even more shocking for me to hear what I'm about to say. Because to me, Mo5 and Kira was the most realistic character. She is the most realistic character out of all of them. And all the moments she has made me feel that way. So whenever I heard what Mo5 says next, really shocked me. And I almost didn't understand how to even interpret it. And I still don't necessarily. But what I, whenever I asked Mo5 how he saw things, he this is what he said. Because I put a lot of effort into making the players want to care about their lives. Which now I recognize I've probably been overburdening with it. I've been a little bit... I've been strong-handed them to try and force them to understand that their characters have values and that they should be immersed and that they should care about their lives. And Mo5 said, uh, whenever I mentioned that, he says, you know, I, I see what you're doing, Fond, and I appreciate it, but there's, I don't know why, but for some reason, every time you try and remind me or try to make me care about my character, it makes me want to care about my character less. Which to me, that seemed totally counterintuitive, almost like, at, you know, something a child would say. I mean, I kind of get it, I suppose. No one likes kind of being told what to do or trying even no one likes taking it that way you know no one likes being told you should care about your character it should be a choice ultimately if they wish to die you can but to me i wish i know that how players are and i wish to uh, put this idea up there because i've played in many games where players don't care about their characters and how that's ended up affecting me you see in that moment i realized and I knew this before, but this was the first time I've ever experienced it in a real sense. People play D&D for different reasons. Mo5 would later on say, I'd say, I would tell him, well, the reason I like playing this way is because to me, D&D is about making drama. It's about immersing yourself as a character. It's about having moments and about growing and making a story. For example, in this situation, if Willie Rose was robbing me, I wouldn't I'd feel defeated, but all my anger would be directed at Willie Rose. He would become someone I hate. I would hate him so much I'd wish to live so I could get revenge on him. But Mo5 would counter me and say, Fond, I just don't see it that way. The way I see it in is it's a game. For me, whenever you die, you make a new character. For me, I don't see I, that I now... Th I don't think about hating Willie Rose. I don't think about D&D the same way you think about it. To me, it's a game. It's not a story. I don't see things the same way. And which, in the moment, I realized that is completely understandable, but I was really sad. I was extremely sad about that. Not because I think he's playing it the wrong way. Not necessarily, at least. I think everyone has the right to play D&D how they want. But I was sad because, in the moment, I realized it would be... This is not just something I can just change something up and ev suddenly everything's all right. I realize that my player, one of my players is not having as much fun as the others. And that is not just as easy as, oh, it's because this and this. It's because he sees the game differently. So he doesn't immerse himself and he feels almost uh, pressured and playing the other way. And he's yet, he does not yet see it the same way. And he may never see it the same way. And so to me, that instantly made me realize how sad it was. For me, it was. How tragic. Because that means all these things I was doing, all these things I do to try and immerse the character and let them feel have these moments and things may not resonate with him. It may not matter. And it's perfectly fine. I love him as a player anyway. But it's also really hard for me to comprehend because he loves roleplay and he really immerses in roleplay. But then it comes to moments where it enters combat and whenever it enters combat, it's like all the roleplay stuff doesn't matter. If my character dies, my character dies. So I'm at this weird impasse where I've realized 
that there's a difference in style that is now affecting some things, making combat less enjoyable. Even though to me, combat is peaking and amazing. And even to a lot of my other players that mentioned as well, they like all the drama and things are being built. So I've decided before next session, I'm going to talk to all my players and explain a few things. I've decided a couple things. Number one, I'm going to step back on trying to uh, preach so much about why people should care about their characters. Instead, I may keep it simply, if they decide to do something, I'll ask them a question. Why is your character willing to die here? Why would your character do so-and-so? Blah, 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 blah. But I'm going to ask of them all two things. Two things and two things only. Number one, if you feel like you enter combat and things and you feel to yourself, I can just make a new character after this. It's all right. I can just, if I die, I just roll a new character. You're right. It's part of the game and it's fine. But please keep that to yourself unless you wish to talk about it in a way that you wish to help overcome it. Because if you verbalize that to me, it is going to indirectly make me care less about your characters. It's going to make me care less about putting effort into involving you in the stories, making me care less about involving you in your bad story and think about these moments. And not that I wish to do that, but I know subconsciously, to me, it's going to make me question, why should I put all this effort into a character who might literally in that session easily be thrown away? Because the things I value and the things I try and make them value don't resonate. However, if that is the case, I'm not going to try and prevent you from thinking that way. Simply put, keep it to yourself, because I don't want to stop playing this way. I wish to continue involving you the same way I involve everyone else. I don't want to subconsciously make this barrier, so please, keep it to yourself. Number two, if you're going to die, please do not die as a disappointment. Do not disappoint me or the others. Whenever you're dead, Please do not let us open up your character sheet and you have all these consumables. You have all of these skills, all of these magical items, all of the stuff that you could have used in that fight. Not necessarily to survive, but to make it more memorable. If you're going to die, die with style. Do not lay over and just crumple down and die. Do not let all of your potential, all of your moments, all of that stuff end in nothing. Make it dramatic. Fight. Use all your items. Use all your potions, consumables. Use your skills that you never thought you'd use. Use every fucking thing you have. Make it the most badass death you can. If you decide, I'm fine dying here. Die like a badass. Die like a hero. Die like the coolest villain ever. Don't just die. Unless you have no choice. But if there are things you can do and you don't do them, that is insulting to me, to yourself, to the other players, and it's truly disappointing for the story in general. So if you're going to die, do it in fucking style. And I've decided that's going to be the last thing I say on this matter to my players. And the reason I'm going to explain them, the reason I care so much and the reason I put so much thought and effort into all of this is because I played so many games where other players don't care very much about their characters, and it is as simple as, I just make a new one. And, you know, if someone else does that, that's fine, but it also hurts my mood. It hurts my mood as someone who's really invested in my character in roleplay, and it really hurts my mood whenever the other players don't react to my moments. Where they don't care about their characters, so why the fuck do they care about mine? They don't care about them more than a base level. So why do they care about my cool stuff? So then I feel alone. I feel alone in my moments. I feel alone in my moments of joy and sorrow. And whenever I hit the climax of my character and no one else is interested or really cares, it just kind of feels pointless. And even worse, that is one such situation. But an even worse situation is whenever all the other players don't really care about their characters and so they don't care about mine. So whenever people go down in fights, to them, if someone goes down and they die, oh, and they just made a new character. But to me, I fucking care about my character. My characters have goals, motives, they have a story they're building. So whenever I see other NPC, other player characters and players not caring about my character, as I slowly sit there and bleed out to death, and my character dies, and none of them blink to sweat, oh, your, your character's dead? Ah, well, you'll make a new one.
and there's nothing to my death. It is a lame, sorrowful death that amounts to nothing, and not even necessarily by my own volition, because I could have been saved, but I wasn't. It makes me stop wanting to make characters that have motives, that have ideals, that have a reason and goals, and I don't want to stop role-playing. I genuinely, it makes me, as soon as I lose the story aspect of my character, I'm no longer playing d and I'm simply wasting time rolling dice, and dice are cruel. So as soon as I lose the feeling that I can control at least a part of my character, I no longer enjoy the game. And I felt that so much, and I know a lot of players are like that, because to a lot of people, it's just a game, and there's nothing more. And that's why I try to cultivate that as a DM in my game. And that's why I'm so adamant on telling people and giving them reasons they should live, and telling them why they should live, and reminding them of their bad story, and reminding them of their friendships with one another, and reminding them of all these things they have to live for. Do you really wish to die in this moment? You have all of this stuff. Is this a fitting death? Do you really feel like this death is good enough for your character? Or do you think it's just good enough because it's a game? You can make a new one. If you were this person in this world and all this stuff had happened to you, would you be okay dying here? Or would you want to continue fighting? Would you be okay falling over and not dying in style. Because to that character you play, this is our last moment in life. To you, you can start a new story. But to them, their story ends. How do they feel? Because it's not just about you. It's also about your character. You're now part of a world. The verisimilitude demands that you care. So please, if you're going to die, and you decide your character's fine to die here, consider everything that's happened to you. Consider all of it. And if, after you've considered everything, you still think, I'm willing to die here, then please don't disappoint. Put on a fucking show. Make it theatrical. Make it badass. Use everything you have. Make it memorable. Make the finale of that character in this world something that they would be happy with. Something that you would be happy with. Something that I would be happy with and all the other players. Make it something amazing. Because character death is the ultimate punishment. And so it should be the ultimate moment. Thank you for watching. My name's Fond. This is the 12th DM Diary of the Throne of Radar. If you want to watch us live, you can see us every Saturday at noon CST over on twitch.tv slash fondthejester. I'd love to see you there. Otherwise, you can watch our VODs here on my channel and the other DM Diaries. Please, take care of yourself. And thank you for supporting me, my game, my players, and making us all very happy. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself.